benefits are sometimes financial. But most genuinely, our gifts are our attitudes. Perhaps we don't always think of that. That our attitudes are a gift. And frankly, some of your attitudes aren't much of a gift. Um, and my attitude sometimes is not a gift to anyone. But as we worship, as we commit ourselves to the Lord, we bring our attitude. If you've been following along in the uh, Lenten devotional uh, that we, we put out, you know, using the booklet or uh, like I am, my, my book is there, but I read it uh, in the email. That theme of humility. bring God our humbleness, our meekness, our gentleness, our, our appreciation for who he is. And from that flows this desire, from that attitude, this desire to serve, to respond, to give of ourselves. And see, without that attitude, we might feel compelled or obligated or pressured to make a donation or to uh, show up for something and, and quote unquote participate. But when we give God as our genuine sacrifice, our attitude, the condition of our heart, So many other gifts flow from that. And so, even our gift here, the bringing of the tithe and the offering, the dedication of who we are, is an opportunity for examination and renewal, recommitment, so that in mind, we bring our offering to the Holy God. Holy God, Receive now these, our gifts. Receive them as you look at our hearts, as you examine our minds, as you see if we indeed are cheerful givers from humble hearts. We ask, Lord, that you use these gifts most of all, would you use us? Use us individually and corporately as a church. Use us universally as your universal church. Use us to change the world. To touch lives one at a time. To make a difference all in the name of Jesus Christ. It's in that name Our offertory hymn, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. I mean, that certainly is something we can offer our prayers. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, using a hymnal in number 278. Um.
together. Uh, Apparently, as I was over here singing that away from the microphone. What a praise it is that we have Alice on the organ, that you don't have to rely on me leading a cappella or singing, particularly on a hymn like that. I just can't seem to get it. Uh, I, I sing it joyfully, and I know the Lord appreciates it, but it's definitely not song leadership, uh, if you will. But as we go to prayer, and we, we think of our singing our praise, and we think of Palm Sunday. We begin our prayer list as we often do, should, with this praise of who he is. We take it for granted, don't we? We begin to go through the motions. For some of you, this is not your first Palm Sunday. Not your 10th or your 20th. You've been through Palm Sunday before. And maybe you waved a, a palm, maybe you folded a palm cross, maybe you um, maybe you sung the anthem, the palms, more than one time. And it's easy to kind of become jaded over. Particularly because we know how the story moves. We know what transpires by the end of the week. But I'd encourage you now as we pray together to pray for a renewing of that enthusiasm of Paul Sunday. That joy. That excitement. That, that racing pulse that must have been felt with, among those crowds. That racing pulse that you have had, have had, you have had at times. When you recognize who Jesus is to you. That sense of That you can have a Palm Sunday attitude one year away from the sanctuary on a, at least where I am, a gray, rainy, achy kind of day. That you can shout Hosanna in your prayer. Even as you recognize that your life has often followed that Holy Week trajectory. Shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he, and later denying him. And feeling guilt and shame. Come around to resurrection morning. Perhaps confusion and excitement and jubilation, and then down the road an appearance. His presence. In your Palm Sunday. That Palm Sunday cadence. We certainly pray for those who are bereaved, those who are lonely, those who are undergoing procedures or recovering from procedures, and those who have testing yet to come, those who are going through rehabilitation, those with job issues and school issues. Those who are dealing with hunger. Questions about a roof over their head. Those who are anticipating moves across the country for employment reasons. Those who are adjusting their lifestyle accommodate the needs of a loved one. For those who have put off wedding ceremonies, and those who have had funeral services for family that were not what they would have anticipated. We pray for those who are finding 
find in new ministry expression. New ways of connecting the gospel to your own lives. Or renewed spiritual practices. We pray for those who in the past year have found new outlets for physical fitness and have made changes. And we pray for those who have lapsed into bad habits. Pray for those who have continued to struggle with addiction. And we frame all of this in Paul Simon. A recognition that we call out, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name. That there's no condition in our lives that Jesus cannot save and redeem. There's no position in which we find ourselves that he's not ready to save. We've sometimes felt We sometimes felt despair that we can't go on. And that's when we need our calm Sunday morning to recognize who it is. Not an angry God throwing thunderbolts. Not a Messiah who came to judge. But meek and lowly, riding on a donkey Seeking to save. I invite you to join with me now in prayer. Holy One, thank you. Thank you for an opportunity even now to restore an enthusiasm, a joy of recognizing Jesus entering our lives. It almost sounds not nearly grand enough to talk about a triumphal entry. But we know that's the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. That it becomes a new day, a new era when we recognize Messiah, when we understand Savior. We thank you for every Palm Sunday moment we have. And we ask you to allow us to, to cling to that when we're having our garden experience. When we're having our Golgotha moment. When we're having our Palladium in a tomb. When we recognize that we are part of the crowd that shouts crucify. When we recognize that we are ones who deny him and say I never even knew him. Allow us in those moments to go back and cling to Palm Sunday, Hosanna, save us, blessed is he who comes in your name. When we are filled with grief, when we weep, when our hearts ache, when our minds are confused, when we're depressed, when we feel trapped in our addiction, when we're lonely, touch our lives. Make again a triumphal entry. Restore the Palm Sunday. 
prayer we offer. With those that are on our prayer list and those that we've been sharing with, and those that we've kept deep in our hearts and never even uttered the word in this room before we pray. All of these things we bring and offer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week we ended our service by singing a, a hymn that is very simple in its music, it's very simple in its lyric, very simple in its intent. We, we ended our, our service last week singing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Now, we recognize that even in simplicity there's complexity. We recognize that it is not as easy to follow Jesus as it is to say, I will follow Jesus. We've all hit bumps in the road. Some have made some very drastic detours. He understands that. He knows that. Jesus knows that it is not always easy to do what you want to do, what you've committed to. He walked among us. He lived a life Thirty some years among a people who struggle. He knows. He knew on that Palm Sunday as he entered Jerusalem that some who were exuberant, excited, exultant were later dismissive. And he knows that some of those who did dismiss him and later said, that was all just hype, caught up in the moment. I jumped on the bandwagon, but I've jumped off. He knows that some of those come around again. And he understands the guilt, the frustration, the shame that they deal with. And he still calls us by name. He still calls us. You might have said, I have decided to follow Jesus. And then later, said, now Jesus, you just wait there while I step aside for a moment. He understands. He doesn't like it. It breaks his heart. But he understands. call you back. He'll welcome you back. And he doesn't just stay there and wait. He's listening. And when needed, he picks us up and carries us back. It's okay if you have shouted Hosanna. It's okay if you said, I have decided to follow Jesus. I was thinking of that I have decided to follow Jesus and I began to reflect on another song that talks about following and I've mentioned this to a couple of people that 
this is the song I was using for the title of our, our sermon today. And invariably, the response was one that I, I should have expected, but I wasn't. The response was people saying, oh, from Sister Act. Some of you have seen that movie, Sister Act, with Whoopi Goldberg. And in that, Whoopi leads the, the choir of nuns as they sing, I will follow him. And it actually works. And to me, that's the surprising thing. That, that song, I will follow him, becomes a hymn, becomes an anthem. Um, it really wasn't written about following Jesus. It actually, when it was originally written, it didn't even have words. It was an instrumental. But words were added to, to come up with that, I will follow him. Um, if, you, if you remember, it begins, love him, I love him, I love him. And where he goes, I'll follow, I'll follow, I'll follow. And then breaks it down. I will follow him, follow him wherever he may go. There isn't an ocean too deep, a mountain so high that it can keep me away. I must follow him, I'll follow him. Ever since he touched my hand, I knew that near him I always must be, and nothing can keep me from him. He is my destiny. I wish I could sing that for you. Wouldn't be pleasant. That love song, I will follow him, certainly should be our response to who Jesus is. Again, that wasn't written for church use, though it, like many things, can be adapted and work that way. And actually, the version that you most likely know of outside of Sister Act was sung by um, an artist who's went by the name Little Peggy March, 1963. And that song she sang ended up 14 weeks on the, on the charts and made it to number one. Little Peggy March is the youngest female artist to have a number one hit in the United States. Like, I will follow her. Again, not expecting that it was going to become a song of faith for some people. It's kind of like when Debbie Boone sang, You Light Up My Life. Some of you remember that being a big hit. That wasn't written as a faith song when she made it to one. Fifteen-year-old Little Pink March said, I will follow him to number Sister Act, Whoopi Goldberg, of all people, made it a very popular song again. And it's a reminder to me that our decision to follow Jesus can come out of some strange places. And that God can use our strange experience and turn it into prayer. I wonder how many folks that Jesus encountered said, I will follow him. I have decided to follow Je Jesus, and he is my destiny. And that maybe took a little turn. Stepped away. I, I, I want you to turn to Went to your passage for today in the, in the Gospel of John. And you've heard me say this before, I struggle with trying to narrow down a bumper sticker scripture. I always, every time I start, I just keep expanding. I'm gonna, I want to talk about the scripture that came before and the scripture that came after and, and how it all fits together. And I think that's part of our our disciple of life, isn't it? Recognizing how the Word of God continues to connect and we we find ourselves hearing it in a larger and larger context. 
that we connect that word to larger and larger areas of our lives. I've listened to our scripture for John chapter 12, verses 1 through 19, but I, I, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to go back up a little bit before that. John chapter 11, we get Lazarus. We get Lazarus being sick, dying, buried. Jesus showing up and, and calling him out of the grave. We get an enthusiastic Jesus. I mean, he's done He's done amazing things, miraculous things, but now he's raised Lazarus from the dead. And certainly, people are being drawn to him. Those things that Jesus has been doing, the crowds that are drawn to him, have gained the attention of the religious leaders. And they don't like the ruckus. They don't like the rambunctious followers. They don't like those crowds. They don't like the talk that's going on. They see it as a threat to the status quo. Now, I, I tell you, I, I hear this, and it, I tend to get pessimistic about the response. The response of believers. The response of those who say, I will not follow him. And we don't want other people to do it either. We kind of often have this jaded view of these folks, and we talk about them wanting to maintain their power. And I think that might be a little simplistic. Though that's where my mind keeps going as well. But they genuinely thought they were doing right. They thought they were doing what was best. And that if they needed to calm some people down, if they needed to be the wet blanket, if they needed to be the voice of authority, they were willing to do so for what they believed to be the greater good. But I think we paint them in the darkest possible way. I don't mean to be in any way political, but I'm going to be for a moment. We have a divide in our nation, in our community, sometimes in our home. A political divide. Where we just can't believe that people who think differently have good intentions. They must be out for an agenda that's evil, that's vile, that's corrupt, that seeks to maintain their power, that seeks to maintain a benefit, a status quo that is against the greater good. And the people that we think that about tend to think the same about people who think the way we do. We tend to paint a harsh picture. Perhaps because it makes it easier for us to feel the way we do if we can make them the evil empire. If they can be the bad guys of the story, then I must be the good. We need to recognize that there are folks with good intentions that disagree with us. And that maybe those who in Holy Week become the villains because we need a villain really weren't so bad and if we were in those sandals we might have agreed with them. What we really need to do when we try to find a villain in the Holy Week story, 
to CRC. Because when we're being honest, when we're being real, when we take a deep breath and step back, we know it was our sin that led to Jesus dying. It wasn't a political party. It wasn't a faction of a religious people. It wasn't a government. It wasn't the church. It was our sin. So we move back into John 11 and we see Lazarus being raised and the crowds coming saying, I will follow him. I will follow Jesus. And some who felt the weight of responsibility. And again, let's face it, there is some corruption often. You learn that in English class, power corrupts, ultimate power corrupts ultimately. But they looked around and said, this isn't getting us anywhere. Something must be done. That leads us to chapter 12 of John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served. Does that surprise anybody who knows Mary and Martha? Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. A beautiful, dramatic moment. A moment that, that places these close friends of Jesus in kind of familiar path. Mary serving. Lazarus being at table with Jesus. Sorry, Martha serving. Mary. And Mary doing the unexpected. The out of the ordinary. You have a feeling that Mary grew up her whole life that family and neighbors also missed that Mary. And shook her head. Verse 4. Right after we get this, the house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, rejected him. It's interesting to me, not so much that it's Judas, but it's, it's one of his disciples. One of those who's literally been following him for years. Objects to this extravagant demonstration. And like a lot of us, starts to question why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Now again, because we know it's Judas, and we know where Judas's path is taking him in the next few days, we certainly here paint Judas as the bad guy. But let's step back for a moment. Certainly, Judas has a point. What could this money have done? And here, this perfume is wasted. I mean, you know that perfume doesn't need the whole container to be spilled. It just takes a little bit. Some of you have been using the same perfume for years. Can you imagine if the first time you used it, you had just poured it all over yourself? Judas kind of has a point. Shouldn't we have used that in some other way? Couldn't she have been a better steward, less wasteful? And let's face it, churches throughout the centuries have had these discussions. How 
much money should you spend on stained glass? What good does stained glass do? Shouldn't we send all that money to missionaries? Shouldn't we go out and, and use that money to put a sandwich in somebody's hand today? And others who said, you know what? You did that, you did this, and now it's all gone. What do we have to show for it? Did it make a difference? Churches who today are, are being formed, that are being planted, that are dealing with that issue of do we rent the local high school auditorium or do we buy a piece of property? Do we create a church home where we are free to do what we want or do we remain in a structure that is cumbersome and burdensome and isn't really ours? And there are no right answers. There are right for you and right for the moment and right for the church and right for its time. But there are no right answers. And often in those discussions, somebody gets left out and somebody becomes the enemy. Because we see things as wins and losses. Judas here smells that perfume and recognizes the value of it and what could have been done with it and asked the question, why was this done? Isn't it, or it was worth a year's wages, something else could have been done. Now, John puts in some commentary here. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what we put in. Have you not been in a situation where somebody's actions, position, attitude was editorialized and perhaps motives found that might not have been there? Now, this is recorded in the Bible, and the Bible is the Word of God. So I'm not going to dispute what John's saying. Maybe Judas is more multifaceted than we give him credit. John allows us to paint him as the bad guy. And when we paint bad guys, we don't often get the ones that we want. How many times have you been the bad guy in somebody's story? How many times have you been on the opposite side of an argument? Or a debate or a discussion. And you know the things that were said about you. How many times have you painted your enemy in the most negative light you could? The room smells like perfume. Judas. Ask, shouldn't something else have been done? Isn't this wasteful? John lets us know why he thinks he just would have said that. Jesus responds, leave her alone. Leave her alone. He doesn't tell Judas, you're wrong. He doesn't get into a whole discussion about it. If he did, he might be saying, Jesus, you're right, you do have a point. But maybe in this situation, there is no right or wrong. There is right for you and right for a time. And I think that's what Jesus gets to in this, this follow-up here. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. That's not a very clear answer about could that have been used. Is it? 
is right for her at the moment. It actually, its intent was not to be sold to the poor. It was to be used for my burial, which then can bring up the question, should the money have been used for my burial? She's chosen to use it now rather than later. How many of you have said, hey, you know what? I'd rather you give me flowers now than send them to my funeral when I can't enjoy them. Don't wait. And maybe you got flowers now and you still send flowers to some of these people. I don't think Jesus is saying, Judas, you're wrong. He's certainly not going to say, Mary, you're wrong. But I think if he were to sit there and say, you're, 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 you both have valid points. And this isn't about right or wrong, it's about attitude. It's about intent. And she's honoring me now. The house was smelled, was filled with the smell of the perfume, the fragrance. A fragrance that should have been used to prepare Jesus' body at the time of his burial. It's interesting that while that perfume fills the room, Lazarus, who would fill the tomb, is there. The one who had been dead and buried and called out of the tomb sits in the midst of all that scent, that aroma, that perfume. Jesus, who in just a few days is going to be executed and buried. Isn't it? 
we often don't understand God moving in our midst, that it's often only when we look back, we go, aha, now, now I see how God was doing a thing. Often it's in negative circumstances. Or things that seem so commonplace that we don't understand. It's only when we look back. But here, it's in great exuberance. It's in these crowds that, now, Jesus had always drawn a crowd. But this kind of language, this excitement is beyond what they've seen before, and they don't understand. It's kind of the same thing with Lazarus the night before, Lazarus, Judas the night before. Don't understand why pouring out this perfume makes sense. It's a waste. Now these disciples, who are disciples, who have been with Jesus, who have made the decision to follow him, they don't understand what's going on. And they're already on the inside. They're already committed. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done. Now the crowd was with him. And he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. That, that word is part of what's getting the crowd fired up. That, that word about Lazarus, that's why they wanted to go see Jesus and Lazarus. It's why the leaders made the decision that Lazarus had to die. Because that crowd is feeding this frenzy. Those who said, I was there when Lazarus walked out of the grave. I, I was looking in the window when Lazarus was at the table with Jesus and, and Lazarus' sister poured out this perfume on him and they talked about burial. And that was just so wild. I was there and now there he is now. Hey, did you see Jesus? And, and he's with his disciples and he's with his friend Lazarus. People are shouting about the Son. About the one who comes to save. The one who comes in the name of the Lord. And they continue to spread the word. And many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, Again, John's a whole book about signs. It should point us to Jesus. Because they heard this, they went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now, has the whole world really gone after him? Probably a large crowd, enough to cause attention, but... Not everybody. And not everybody that was there in the crowd watching was deciding to fall. Not everybody who was there in that crowd who was shouting. Not everyone there who was saying, this is the guy. I'm on Team Jesus. Not everybody who was there was saying, I will follow him wherever. But the leaders saw it that way. They saw that crowd and they painted it as the whole world. As they were making up their justifications for why they were had to kill him, they were exaggerating what was happening. Again, we do that when we want to our enemy in the worst position. They always say, or everything they do is. And if the whole world has gone after Jesus, the Romans are not going to like that very much. So we've got to do something about that. Now what they didn't realize is that they were actually, again, here being a little prophetic. 
Because eventually the whole world would have the opportunity to come to Jesus. Because what happens in the next few days is literally world changing. They couldn't see it, they couldn't understand it. But this part of the world, 2,000 years later, Still gone after Jesus. Still sings, I have decided to follow Jesus. Still makes the decision that wherever he goes, I will follow him. And so that's kind of where we're at this week. To make a decision.
just the start of Holy Week. We will have um, service live on Thursday, Monday, Thursday. Um, be available through Facebook. Um, and then a recorded Good Friday service will be available beginning at noon on Friday. And certainly next Sunday we'll be gathered here again uh, on Zoom at 10 o'clock and beginning on Facebook at 1030 as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. I hope that you'll be able to join with us for at least some of those services together. And now receive the benediction. Go. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. Go in the name of the one who came in the name of the Lord. Go to the one that they shouted, Hosanna, save us.